So is makeup hurting your eyes? Is it contributing to sensitive eyes and dry eye symptoms? These are really good questions. These are things that eye doctors see all the time, especially with our lady patients, but even some male patients who wear makeup. We see makeup on the surface of your eyelid under high magnification. We can even see it floating in your tear film, especially if there's glitter in it. I even posted some pictures in a video of one of my patients where I averted her eyelid, looked underneath, and you could see mascara that had been absorbed and stuck into her eyelids. So sometimes a little scary. So we have these questions if makeup, in fact, has particles, has ingredients that could be, in, in fact, aggravating the eyes, leading to dry eyes, irritation, all of these things. So when it comes to makeup on the eyes, this is a big question, and that's exactly why tonight we have a very special guest. Tonight we have Dr. Laura Perryman, MD, also known as the Dry Eye Master. Dr. Perryman is a leading authority in the realm of ocular surface disease and dry eye. She's also a leading authority in cosmetics and makeup use and their ingredients for the eyes and the eyelids. Dr. Perryman is the founder and director of Dry Eye Services and clinical research at the Perryman Eye Institute. She practices at, in Seattle, Washington. So uh, if you happen to live on the West Coast of the United States or anywhere near there and have the opportunity to see her or visit her clinic, I strongly suggest you reach out. Uh, in fact, I had the pleasure and real honor uh, a few years ago, Dr. Perriman was not the, uh, this is not the first time she's been on the show. In fact, uh, we did a video where when OptiLite, an IPL treatment was first FDA approved, I got to fly out to her clinic and I received IPL from <laughs> her that day uh, with amazing results. So if you haven't seen that video, uh, I do suggest you check that out. Um, but without further ado, uh, please give a warm, loving welcome to Aww. Dr. Laura Perriman. I do, I do want to start off saying thank you again, Dr. Perriman, for being on here. It's a, again, means a lot that you're here. Uh, also, um, happy birthday. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, I, I encourage everybody who is catching us live here, or if you're catching us on the replay, uh, go ahead and drop a bunch of happy birthdays in for Dr. Perriman, because uh, she, uh, she's being very generous with her time of being on here being a guest speaker uh, before she goes off and celebrates with her friends this evening. So again, happy birthday and thank you, Dr. Perriman. Aw, oh, thank you so much. You know, uh, Dr. Allen, Joey, my friend, this is a true honor and privilege to be here on your show. I so respect what you're doing for all of our wonderful dry patients and creating excellent content, news you can use, practical tips, vetting the different things. Like you're doing good work, my friend. And I really will do anything that I can to support you in all of your awesome endeavors. You are, you are hitting the nail on the head. I just love your content and, and how you're helping our community. Again, thank you. Um, so to kind of get things going, I know Dr. Perriman, you have prepared a kind of a small lecture to talk about this topic. And I know it goes pretty deep because if any other doctors are watching this uh, and you've seen some of Dr. Perriman's um, lectures she gives to doctors, they are really high level, so much so it, like, it impresses everybody in the room. So without further ado, let me pull up some of your slides and we'll see, uh, I'll let you go. Great. Well, um, you know, when, it, when we get these questions from our patients, I want to answer it as scientifically as I possibly can. I want to look for the truth. I want to have some solid grounding with which I answer questions as best as I know it in real time. So you'll see some heavy duty science in here, but it's also helpful to lean on science when you just don't know, when you're just not sure. When you hear something, you're like, wow, is that actually true? Maybe not. What does the science say? So we'll hit some mythology that's talked about in the beauty industry, especially amongst our wonderful dry eye patients. They're, they really want to know what they can try and what they can use and what's not going to exacerbate their condition. But, you know, something that really um, concerns me is when I see fear mongering in the beauty space. Um, 
you know, our dry patients are already anxious and they're already worried about daily practices that's making their condition worse. And so I, when I see fear mongering really for no good reason, I'm just like, oh, it kills me. And I want to do what I can to help set the record straight and to help ease everybody's mind and concern. So there's some good news in here. So we're going to hit, call the boogeyman out of the shadows, put some light on them. And uh, then we'll also talk about the good news in the beauty space. How's that sound? Sounds great to me. I know uh, kind of debunking things because they're here on, on the internet and even amongst some healthcare professionals, there's some misinformation. And uh, I'm happy that again, you're here to kind of shed some light on the truth. Yeah. And so this is just a skimming of the surface of some of the misinformation that I see propagated out there. I've written dozens of articles. I've given dozens of dozens of lectures. I was a medical expert on a class action lawsuit. Like I've peeked behind the curtain. And I can I can tell you it's worse than you could possibly imagine, but I will share with you what, what I can. So let's, uh, let's talk about this. I think I can advance. Yes, I can. So, you know, the truth, the truth um, is light and light when it's shined in shadows of darkness, um, boogeymen and untruths shrink. So that's the whole point of this. And there's a huge laundry list of things that people say, oh, that's bad. That's a bad ingredient. But is it really true? I mean, think about it for a second. Molecules like mono oxygen dihydrate kill thousands of people every year. What is that? It's water right? <laughs> so when you hear these fear mongering things, ask, well, what concentration, what delivery system? If you take water through your mouth, it's fine. If you put it in your lungs, it's not so good. So you have to know like how much, how, where's it going? How long is it staying there? These are all critical considerations when we're talking about cosmetics. It's tempting to boil it down into a boogeyman list of things to avoid, but it's just not accurate. It's just not true. So let's go through just a few of these. So I broke it down into the four P's, the particles in cosmetics, the preservatives, the prostaglandin analogs, and phytoextracts. And there's uh, some really excellent sources of information on uh, the internet and uh, Instagram. And I'll share these sites with you at the end as well. But I heartily recommend following these two particular cosmetic chemist PhD experts that deep dive into the science of cosmetic chemistry. So let's start off with the particles. Um, many formulations contain nylon or rayon, and we have case reports of conjunctivitis associated with the nylon particles. Now, these got lodged in the conjunctiva of this patient. They had to be surgically removed. So what is it about the length of these fibers? What's around these fibers? And why is it getting lodged in the conjunctiva? You posted a fantastic case showing a mask aroma in the fornix of a lid that you had flipped. And I messaged you, I'm like, what was she using? I need to know. And then I'll look up the ingredients. And because my guess is that there's probably fibers in there that act like little javelin spears and can lodge under the conjunctiva and cause permanent discoloration, stays in there permanently, can cause irritation like this. So um, watch out for fibers, nylon fibers. We do have case reports about this. And this is a physician. I was in a physician chat group one Saturday and she's like, I'm internal medicine, but look at this thing on my eye. And I'm like, ooh, what are you using? What's going on? Contact lens wear, had a new mascara. I'm like, what kind? What are you using? Looked up the ingredients. Aha, rayon, very popular uh, uh, mascara, a, a, a nice mascara, but caused problems with, with her eye. So you, you do need to watch out for fibers. Well, I'm a little bit of a nerd in case you couldn't tell, and I apologize in advance, but <laughs> we're like-minded that way. Like we want to know what's going on. And so I made this the study where I took a whole bunch of different mascaras and I looked at them under the microscope. I'm like, wow, if fibers can lodge in the conjunctiva like this, what else is in mascara that has the potential to lodge in the conjunctiva? So I made this little study where I took 14 different brands, high end, low end, drugstore, you know, all, you know, luxury, clean beauty, all these different claims and laid them out on a microscope. And I tried to find out, and I presented it at, uh, Women Ophthalmology and also American Society of Cataract Refractive Surgeons were working on a manuscript to publish this. But 
I knew that failure to remove your makeup associated with more dry eye symptoms, the higher speed scores, those are your dry symptom indices. But I, I wanted to know if I could predict um, the irritancy potential based on the particle particulate appearance under the microscope. And here are the smears. I took each brand, pump, pump, smeared it in one spot, pump, pump, smeared it in the middle, and then pump, pump, smeared it in a drop of an artificial tear. Cause I wanted to know mm -hmm. how fast is it dry? What does it look like after it's dried and I put an artificial tear on it? How low, how well does it stay put? And what, what does it look like if it's mixed with an artificial tear? Well, I was shocked to find that many brands contain nylon fibers, rayon fibers. And so you really need to be aware of these kinds of things in your dry eye patients. Um, the sad news is that marketing claims do not assure less ocular surface irritancy potential. So um, ask your patients what they're using. The um, I was surprised to see that it was obvious which mascara formulations were waterproof. That was very easy to see in this assay. It was very easy to see which ones um, diffused evenly in an artificial tear and which ones were really clumpy and almost um, chunky. And I wonder if that had something to do with your mask aroma patient as well. Um, but it was this is an interesting area of work that uh, needs more study, but we will continue to look for truth and look mm -hmm. at it in different ways. And I think that's one of the points of today's discussion is, you know, cosmetics, skincare have always been from the beauty industry in, from dermatology in, and I propose that it needs to be from the eye out. It needs to be designed with the eye at the epicenter. At least that's how I feel about it. Next uh, topic is formaldehyde donating preservatives. Preservatives, the other P. Hydroxymethylglycinate is a common formaldehyde donating preservative. You may not smell it in a product, like example, an eyelid wipe, but if you mix it with water, you can smell the formaldehyde. DM, DM, hydantoin, I call that the dum dum molecule, quaternium 15, and ureas are all formaldehyde donors. And at very, very low concentrations, even below what you can smell, you can get irritation of the corneal nerves and ocular irritation. So watch out for formaldehydes. Can yes. I, can I ask with that slide, um, like if I was to pick up a, a, a box or, or some makeup products at the store, is that how they would be written yes. out or spelled? That's how you they would be that written out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good, That's how good. it would be written out. Yep. Um, so those are those are the four, you know, preservatives that I would avoid because they have demonstrated toxicity in cell culture. Right. It's uh, easy to show that even if you give cells growth factors to ensure survival, that in the context of these formaldehyde donating preservatives, they don't survive. Right. So imagine what's happening to your corneal epithelium, to your conjunctival epithelium, to your poor little goblet cells, the unsung hero of the ocular surface. Like imagine what's happening to those guys. Right. So avoid avoid those uh, for sure. Alcohol gets a bad rap. It's five o'clock somewhere at all times. But that's not where I'm going. <laughs> Anytime you put an OH group at the end of a molecule, it's technically an alcohol from a scientific standpoint. Glycerin is a OH on top of a, it's a hydroxylated sugar is what it is. But glycerin is used in skincare. Glycerin is used in eye drops. Glycerin is used in cosmetics. It's a friendly thing. Yes, it's an alcohol, but not all alcohols are bad, right? Phenoxyethanol, there's that OL word again, is another one of them. And this is pretty small. Oh, you can see it on the far right side in the middle row. That's okay. phenoxyethanol. I, I can try to, let's see if I can make it larger. Ooh. Did you, do you have a little cursor? Does my little arrow show up? I don't up? know if we have a cursor. Oh, okay. um, we can try it next oh, time. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll just show it this way. So phenoxy, this is organic chemistry nomenclature 101. This is how you name the baby. <laughs> you have a, a benzene ring or a phenoxy ring and the OHCC and OH is the ethanol part and it's tacked together. So thus phenoxy ethanol, right? So that's, that's the name of it. And it turns out that this is a wonderful paraben alternative but in low concentrations in combination with ethyl hexylglycerin, you get the synergistic preservative capacity well below concentrations that are thought to be irritating to the eye, including in cell culture. So I'm gonna show you some data here. This is very interesting. They took, this is 24 hours exposure. 
to uh, phenoxyethanol and parabens in human meibomian gland cell cultures. And so that's number one, a really long time to be exposed. If you put it on your lashes, um, it's far away from the meibomian gland stem cells. So this is a little bit of an over extrapolation, but I just want to demonstrate that where you see this star, this is very, very low concentration and at 0.01% phenoxyethanol, which is just above the lower limit that we use, 0.075, when we mix it with um, ethyl hexaglycerin and 0.625 with phenoxyethanol in common concentrations in skincare and cosmetics, there is no cell death compared to the control. So phenoxyethanol is given a bad rap, but is it really? We need to know the concentration in the product. We need to know the contact time. Where is it being located, right? So I think these things get a bad rap unnecessarily. I can. I, I just want to say I'm really happy that you're touching on prostaglandin analogs <laughs> because that's that, 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 there's a lot of confusion I think about that. Yes, yes, there is. So prostaglandin analogs are a huge class of molecules that are used in a wide variety of medical specialties. It's used uh, for cervical ripening to induce uh, labor in women. It's used as a glaucoma drop to lower your eye pressure. Uh, it's used to make your eyelashes grow, but there's only one FDA approved safety and risks demonstrated clearly, clearly up front. And that's Latisse. That's the only thing that's out there. Unfortunately, over-the-counter prostaglandin analog laced eyelash growth serums, there's about a third of them that are laced with prostaglandin analogs. And that's a big problem because you don't know the concentration. And it turns out a lot of these prostaglandin analogs are more potent than what we put on the eye at, and they're at higher concentration than what we put on the eye for glaucoma medications. This is crazy. And we all know the prostaglandin analog uh, detriments, right? Orbital fat atrophy, discoloration of the lid skin, redness of the skin, meibomian gland dysfunction, dry eye, conjunctival injection, and in some cases, even swelling in the retina. Cystoid macular edema can happen. These right. are known complications of prostaglandin novels. So for your audience, I want you to learn how to look for the word prost, not the Polish drinking chair. No, no. <laughs> that's different. <laughs> Prost, prost, prost. That is the root for a prostaglandin analog. And look for these in your um, in your products and do not use them because they're at very high concentration. Um, this one, M2 eyelash serum sold heavily in Europe, uh, is marketed as isoplo isopropyl chloprostinate free. Well, what does it have instead? It's got methyl amido alpha prostanol. Mmm, very potent stuff, right? And it creates all kinds of uh, complications in users. And like I said, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist and I'm a molecular immunobiologist by training. I'm like, ooh, what is the molecular potency of these things? And it turns out that isopropyl chloprostinate is more potent than Travaprost. In the adulterated OTC eyelash growth serums, they don't disclose the concentration. I know what it is, but I cannot tell, I cannot reveal. Um, but it's much higher than you would um, ever use as a topical IOP lowering agent, right? So you're going to have more complications from it. Phytoextracts. Tea tree oil gets a bad rap as well. Uh, T4O gets a bad rap. And, you know, tea tree oil, in order to kill them, it actually got to be at really high concentrations, like higher than what is even tolerable for most mortal humans. <laughs> it's like you have to be... Uh, 5% for at least 15 minutes. And most commercial grade products are at 0.1 to 0.2% and the total of total tea tree oil. But the four terpenol is only 40% of that total tea tree oil. So we're really talking very, very low concentrations, which makes it awesome for bacterial control. Not so awesome for Demodex, right? Demodex are like the cockroaches of the eyelid. They're hard to get mm -hmm. rid of. Thank goodness we have... Um, Low to or 0.25% in the U.S. XDMV, which has been a game changer for a lot of our Demodex blepharitis patients, don't right. you think? Yeah, I've been prescribing it for several of my patients, and it's it is a night and day difference for for basically everybody I've used it on. Yep. Um, and I'm happy that you're just mentioning contact time concentration and how important that is, because mm -hmm. uh, you know sometimes if you read a, a research study, it's like yeah, that shows it's 
really bad for the eyelid, but the concentration is way beyond anything that you would find in a product. <laughs> it's so I'm yeah. just happy that you're mentioning that. It's good to know. Yep. Concentrations, contact time. Yes. All, all that stuff matters. So um, it's often ma also maligned as causing a prepubertal gynecomastia. What the heck is that? That means abnormal breast bud development in uh, prepubertal boys, right? So when that's maligned, they're looking at a study with three patients. It's just a case series report. The predominant phytoestrogen in these boys was actually lavender oil and very high concentration. Only one of them was exposed to tea tree oil. And yet it's been over extrapolated into being this hormone disruptor causes gynecomastia and prepubescent boys. I'm like, mm, based on just one case series of three patients. Um, so always confirm with the science, always look up the, uh, the references and read those papers. Uh, essential oils are popular because of the idea that they're natural. Um, but again, concentration and contact time, there's a high uh, allergenicity potential of essential oils. And so we just need to be aware of them just because something is natural and it's all an essential oil does not mean it's harmless. So put separate those two in your mind, natural being harmless, because that's not the case. Parabens are malaligned as well, and they're necessary. Parabens are probably, no, parabens are the most extensively studied preservative system in cosmetics, and they're found in blueberries, right? This is an important thing to know. Uh, they're often maligned. You see a lot of things that are paraben-free. This is marketing sticks. Um, again, decades of safety around the use of parabens. They are found in nature in blueberries. That's one of the preservatives for blueberries. And at low concentrations, um, excuse me, let me say that again. The paraben estrogen affinity, estrogen receptor binding affinity is one ten thousandth that of pure estrogen. There's patient, there's, there's people that say parabens cause breast cancer, but that was based off of one paper looking at the presence of paraben in breast cancer pathology slides. There was no control and um, it was only 22 patients and that paper has since been redacted as being really not quality science, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, be careful of all those myths that you hear about. Carbon black, it's bad. Well, only if you breathe it at high concentrations in cosmetics, it's used at less than 10%. It's considered safe by the FDA and there's abundant um, safety data to back that up. So watch out for pro cosmetic performance claims. This is how, I mean, the marketing around cosmetics is frustrating because it sounds good, but it's meant to sound good. <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's safe or effective. For example, 93% of users reported that their eyelashes looked longer and thicker. That's what a mascara is supposed to do, right? So just be careful of those, of those marketing claims. Um, and they don't have the same level of scrutiny, scrutiny that you and I are used to when we recommend eye medications, things that have been through FDA approval. So there's a, a lot of smoke and mirrors around marketing claims and user data. So um, quality sources of information, we just skim the surface, particles, preservatives, prostaglandin analogs, phytoextracts. How do you determine the difference between what science says and what the pseudoscience is? And you have to be careful. Now that the, the debunking is over, should we talk about what I can use? around the eyes. Yeah, there's some good news here, everyone. So this is a um, round table excerpt that we just published in this month's optometric management. And there's abundant literature showing that there's benefits of ingredients such as caffeine, hyaluronic acid, niacinamide, certain peptides, vitamin C and vitamin E for use around the delicate eye area. Um, niacinamide has a critical function for preserving the skin barrier function. And considering that the skin of the eyelids is so very thin, 
it's really important to repair, to keep that skin barrier function nice and tight to keep the bad guys out, you know, whether it's allergens or irritants or chemicals or whatever it is. And you can enhance that with niacinamide. Hyaluronic acid is great for plumping up the epidermis to give that illusion of hydration, of, um, of glow, of luminance, of reduced dry skin appearance, um, luminosity, et cetera. I was going to say, I think all of those ingredients, uh, if someone ever uses like, you know, anti eye bag, um, creams and things mm -hmm. like that, I think almost all of those I've seen in some fashion in, in those different eye creams. Mm -hmm. And, and the overall composition of those eye creams is what's so critically important as far as its ocular surface friendliness. Because right. uh, just because something says ophthalmologist tested does not mean it's safe for the eyes. That's the frustrating part. But I have more good news for you. Um, these are my two favorite sources of authentic cosmetic information. The EcoWell and Lab Muffin Beauty Science. The, uh, the EcoWell has an Instagram channel. Love her stuff. She is a straight shooter, man. And uh, she also has a YouTube channel. She has a website as well. High quality scientific information. I was going to say the EcoWell is new for me, but Lab Muffin Beauty Science, I've been watching a lot of her content. I've even referenced it in a video um, not too long ago. So Perfect. Uh, that's, that's great to see that. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm a big fan of both of them. I think they're doing a fantastic job. And here's just a small uh, listing of the references I've used to research my talk. There's a lot there and you can exit out of that. Um, <laughs> so let me go back to um, just want to say a huge thank you again to you, Laura, for, for doing this and showing this presentation. I know we have a lot of questions going on right <laughs> now in the live chat. So if you guys are here for the live, uh, we are going to be doing live Q&A toward the end. But I have prepared some questions I want to walk through and ask Dr. Perriman because we've we've had a lot of questions on the channel about cosmetics, about uh, different whether it be makeup, whether it mm -hmm. be um, certain trends in the makeup fashion mm -hmm. world. Uh, and I think these are, are just really good questions. So give me a second just to see yeah. if I can pull them all up. So while you're pulling that up, there's one last thought I want to leave you with without with that uh, content I prepared. Mm -hmm. um, ophthalmologist tested does not confer true ocular safety. Understand that. It's based off of a 1944 assay using terminology that we don't even use as clinicians anymore. It means nothing, unfortunately. Here's the good news. There are two companies who have gone the extra mile to actually look at ocular surface safety metrics, tear breakup time, tear meniscus height, staining, symptoms. These are all things that nobody has looked at before. And we now have four products available that have that degree of testing integrity that I need in order for me to recommend something. That's a high bar. That, yeah. Uh, and then that's something that um, I, th I know myself when some of these new products are coming out, even in the eye care space, uh, when they start being able to show, hey, this is clinical studies that they've done on you know hundreds, if not thousands of people for month, months and months and months to be able to make these sort of uh, claims. I think that, that at least from any sort of healthcare practitioner, that's something I think will uh, kind of echo volumes. Yeah. So let's go on to some questions. First, kind of good and bad makeup. Uh, we kind of answered that already, I think, with, with so much of your lectures. So um, just kind of what to look for, what to what to look for, what to avoid. I think you covered that pretty good. So we'll go on to maybe some favorite brands of yours. Because yes. I asked this, I asked you before, and you said that there are some products that you carry in your clinic. Would you be able to talk a little bit about some of these products? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, I'm having a little bit of a brain hiccup on one thing, so I'm I want to look it up sure. for you. Hold on, just one sec. Sure. Having a little bit of a brain. What do you carry in your clinic for skincare? So right now we carry two brands. We carry Eyes of the Story, and we carry 2020 Beauty. Those Both are of those. the two. And, and um, how was how was your customer feedback then? You know, it's it, it depends on the product of each because any of our viewers who are, have tried any of those products or looked them up, uh, they carry different individual products with each each within each of them. Uh, for example, like Eyes of the Story has like eyelid cleansers. They have a mascara. They have um, some like facial uh, facial ointments and creams. Uh, and so I've I've 
I, some people really love like the, the cleansers and then some people say they really like the face like ointment or cream but um i honestly don't know if i've had too much feedback on like if they, people have had reactions or sensitivity mm -hmm. to them i think it is overwhelmingly positive but the mm -hmm. um i guess personally the only the only uh thing i i, I tried one video last year where i actually tried putting on makeup for the first time in my life and it was it was horrible um but uh this is just a packaging thing i have with 2020 beauty is that the eyeshadow they don't have a color on the cap for me to like say oh here's three different eyeshadow colors i don't know which one they is which what color they are unless i open the cap and look at it so i think just from a, a product development standpoint they should at least put a color swash or something on there just so that people can see from across the room mm -hmm. oh yeah i need this blush or this color so that's from from a gentleman who doesn't who doesn't wear makeup that's my only thought i think it would be so fun to do a makeover for you oh no way <laughs> <laughs> maybe someday then i can test out all these other eyelid creams. exactly <laughs> awesome so yeah when it comes to skincare um we I, I hunted high and low for a skincare line that gave me the performance I need without ocular irritancy and I found Epions love it uh fantastic line great performance great uh management and adjunctive care for rosacea patients seborrheic dermatitis patients acne patients without being so harsh uh, around the eyes. So I really love that. Noon is another line that we brought on. Um, again, really helpful in that adjunct for the dermatologic conditions that go along with a lot of our sensitive eye patients, particularly rosacea. Um, so we're having a lot of good luck with, with these two product lines. But I don't carry any cosmetics in my clinic because I don't, I'm not ready to recommend anything. I know, I know too much. That's that. I mean, that speaks volumes. That's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it's tough sometimes because you're like, in our position, you know, in our clinic, they're like, what should I be using? It's like, OK, well, <laughs> what can I what can I say? <laughs> right. Well, you'll soon have some answers because they'll be like actual ocular safety, mm -hmm. true ocular safety science behind what you can recommend, at least when it comes to a makeup remover an eyelash and eyebrow growth serum mm -hmm. and an eye cream and soon a second company coming out with a really unique formulation of an eye makeup remover that um, also showed excellent tolerability from an eye perspective. I do want to um, just kind of call out to everybody who's watching that this information about cosmetics, everything Dr. Perriman's sharing is still, I would say, pretty fresh and new to most doctors in eye care. Mm -hmm. It's not something that was taught in school. It's not something that I think most doctors even ha are hearing about. So uh, just with, I would say in the last three to five years, it's becoming more of something that we're, we're discussing and talking about. And Dr. Perriman's like one of the people who's doing the research and is presenting it and teaching a lot of our doctors. So, um, so I just wanted to point that out so everybody understands this. That's why no one maybe has heard about makeup being a concern mm -hmm. for their eyes. Yeah. It's a little passion project because, you know, I had patients ask me years and years ago, what can I use? What do you recommend? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I need to go looking for it. Right. Uh, so next question is kind of like if somebody is using something, and mm -hmm. they, whether it be, it has, you know, they, they think all, all the ingredients seem fine, uh, but they're not sure, but they try it and their eyes are feeling weird or, or something's changing. How can they tell if they maybe have a sensitivity or allergy to it? What kind of symptoms might they have? Yeah. So anytime you have itch uh, associated uh, close to the use of a product, that suggests a true allergy. You can have a sensitivity, um, but that's not always a true allergy, right? And so if the uh, itch response responds to an over-the-counter antihistamine drop like Lastikaf or Pataday, then that suggests a true allergy, right? Um, the other way to test is to take a break from the products, get your eyes calmed down, and then re-challenge. And that's a good way to know if there's an allergy or a sensitivity. If you start noticing scaling and breaking down of the skin, that's that would be a sensitivity and possibly atopic dermatitis, which is a more involved form of allergy. And I do see that on occasion. Although interestingly, I will say that um, 
a lot of the eyelid dermatitis that I see is from overstripping the oils, the delicate oils around the eyelid skin and just changing the cleanser and the makeup remover system to things that have a far gentler surfactant load or don't have surfactants mm -hmm. that can help slow down the oh, overstripping. And then you can use your um, eye safety proven makeup cream. Um, I don't know if you want to mention brands or not yet, but um, I mean, it, you're, you're, you're free and welcome to, to mention things, but um, okay. I think I'm, that the next question might get to that, but uh, it is, I just want to say that's, that's something new I just learned is that it may not be the makeup that's causing the problem, but it may in fact be the cleanser and the use of the cleanser that's, yeah. that's causing this. That's something I, I honestly did not know until just now. So thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, think about it. The surfactants break down the lipid barrier in the epithelium and that might be overstripping. Yeah. It makes total sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. So what about like moisturizers? What um, what are some yeah. gentle moisturizers that are good for around the eyelids? Mm -hmm. So I'm a big fan of the Bausch Eye Illuminations uh, Eyelid mm. Brightener Cream. It's really simple ingredients. It's got a little caffeine, a little niacinamide, lots of hyaluronic acid. It's just, an, it, there's no fragrance. It's just an easy, simple moisturizing barrier to put on the delicate eyelid skin. Hmm. And that's just really good for moisturizing it, keeping it smooth. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was, they actually did um, clinical observer and participant um, outcome metrics, not only, and they also looked at the eye safety, but they showed that the, um, the clinician observed the improvements as much as the participants did in the skin luster, in the moisturization, the reduction in the dry flakiness, the luminosity of the skin um, at 30 days and also at two months. That's great. That's really mm -hmm. cool. I'm going to look that one up um, myself. And for everyone who's uh, asking, yes, we will try to put updated links to all of this information in the description uh, shortly after the video. Mm -hmm. The next uh, kind of question I have is about makeup replacement. Mm. How often should this happen? <laughs> because I've heard from some people, some of my patients, some of my friends, that they've they've had makeup for five to ten years. Right. <laughs> it's like, is is that is it, is it that supposed to last that long or, or what? <laughs> so the simple answer is, if it's wet, definitely replace it before five years. If it's dry. Nothing's really going to grow on that. Mm -hmm. um, so your eyeshadows, your blushes, those are probably fine. Um, as far as facial powders are concerned, I try to get my patients away from that because I do think a lot of particulate fallout occurs into the tear film. So we try to shy away from those around the eye. But as far as like replacement goes, um, as long as it's you know clean and dry and you've got a clean brush that you're applying it with, I think you're okay. Now, wet products are a different deal altogether. Uh, Demodex can live up to five days in mascara. So if you go see your eye doctor and they do your in-office zest and IPL sessions and they've given you the ex -Demvi prescription, please buy a fresh mascara and highlighter because you don't want to recontaminate. Um, right. Because that's kind of the idea that you're taking the mascara out of the tube, you're putting it on your eyelashes, and whatever's living on your eyelashes from microorganisms mm -hmm. is going to get on those lashes. And microorganisms love what? Like damp, yeah. like damp, like enclosed areas. So you put Party it right time back in, in the, the tube. USA. Yeah. <laughs> and then <laughs> it sits there and it basically breeds. So, like, how. That's why I think uh, a lot of if you if you're following what's recommended on a lot of boxes, I've seen like what's it one month, three months. I'm not I sure. It depends on the brand, right? To see more of that, right? I think that's important because um, not all preservative systems are created equal. Again, parabens are the gold standard preservative system. Mm -hmm. uh, paraben phenoxyethanol is a good alternative, but the concentration of, of all of those helps to determine the shelf life. So, example, for example. Um, I heard through the grapevine, I haven't been able to substantiate this, so apologies if I have it wrong, that Sephora will not sell anything that doesn't have at least a two-year shelf life. Now, um, that suggests that there's a very high level of preservatives in those products. But um, again, I would really encourage people to look for the uh, 
you know, the three month, six month, 12 month, whatever preservative um, replacement system that's recommended. But I do think mascara should be replaced more often than that. It's good. Like I would say, you know, it's interesting because when they do um, microbial testing on formulations, they inoculate a whole bunch of bacteria inside the tube and then they put it in the warm incubator and they look and see what grows out 30 days later. That's only 30 days, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's probably somewhere between 30 and 90 days. But we don't know for sure. We'll see. <laughs> so the next the next one is your opinion on sleeping in makeup. Ooh. So um, we highly recommend removing your makeup and before bed because um, the uh, it seems to irritate the eyes. And we presented data on this at Arvo in 2017 that uh, patients who do not remove their makeup, dry patients who do not remove their makeup, have much higher speed scores than those who do. Um, so yeah, removing your makeup every night is important to do, but not all makeup removers are created equal. And again, we now have two that have shown true ocular surface safety testing, and that's the um, Bausch Eye Illuminations mm -hmm. Micellar Makeup Remover and Optase um, has a new makeup remover, which is very interesting. It's a uh, preservative free and a totally different formulation, really simple ingredients list. So we now have two uh, yeah, makeup yeah, remover I, systems that are good. I'm kind of holding them both up here to the side. Um, again, the eye illuminations has been out for a little bit and I've been able to try this one. And this Optase one is just launched this last yeah. weekend. Uh, and I, I was very lucky to get this bottle because um, it, it it's not even on the store shelves for a few more weeks, but um, so far I've used it once and, uh, it's pretty cool. So, yeah. Awesome. The key with that other product, the Optase product is mm -hmm. you have to use a cotton pad. Don't use your fingers because as soon as it comes in contact with water, uh, the charge properties that lift mm -hmm. the debris neutralize. So you, you apply it with a cotton pad or a microfiber cloth to apply it to the makeup. And if you're wearing waterproof makeup, um, which I actually don't have a problem with, if you have an effective way to remove it. Yeah. I just let it soak just a little bit longer before you gently wipe away. So that's that's that was actually my next question is kind of like makeup remover. What should people oh. maybe be looking to try? So you answered that. That was perfect. Uh, Turning it off all the way. Um, I will say that uh, the, the new lid system yeah. uh, seems to really help get the last pieces, parts, bits off of makeup off every night. So mm -hmm. I really like that system for complete makeup removal. And I, uh, I, I've i used the new lids device for a long time and I still use, I'm not, I haven't been using it as much because I'm doing a self-study. Uh, oh. Like if people have seen some of my other self-study videos uh, on dry eye products, uh, I've been doing one for the last three months. So I haven't, I haven't touched it for the last three months. Um, but uh, my new lids at home device, I've used that and still, it still works for me. What's the, your experiment, Joey? You'll have to stay tuned. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a heads up before, but, uh, it. but uh, it'll it'll be a good video. Uh, <laughs> but doing a three month self study has been has been interesting. So uh, the next question is makeup trends. I want to know yeah. your thoughts about things like tight lining or, or water lining, um, tattoo remove like eyelid tattoo. Because mm -hmm. some people come in and their eyelids have been tattooed. And then uh, mm -hmm. even false eyelashes. These That's a huge trend in the last maybe yeah. five, six years. Uh, and I see so many patients with false eyelashes or fake eyelashes. Yeah. Um, and i just love to know your thoughts on these. Well, let's take the false eyelashes first. Um, mm -hmm. I know they're popular. I know people think they look good. They don't, and they're aging, and they're obvious. So I don't think they're um, they're all that great, uh, and we do see complications from them, uh, allergic reactions to the glue. That uh, Kathy Mastrada sent me a case. Uh, one of our wonderful colleagues in New York, she sent me a case of this person who had a really impressive uh, reaction to the eyelash glue extensions and also to tattooing. Um, actually, I have that back. She sent me the tattoo case. My friend had the allergic reaction ironically owns a eyelash parlor um <laughs> so i was like yeah you might need to look at some other types of glues <laughs> but um anyway so i think tattooing is problematic i think eyelash extensions are problematic because they're expensive and so you don't get in there and scrub and remove 
makeup the way you should. Um, you and I have both seen teeming Demodex bacterial situations at the base of eyelash follicles. I've seen uh, Demodex get transferred to patients from eyelash extension salons. So um, yeah, they're not good. No bueno. As far as tattooing goes, there's the microtrauma, the inks may be problematic. And we do have some published literature showing an association between my bombing gland dysfunction and tattoo eyeliner. The rub is, excuse the pun, is that um, we don't know if the MGD is a hallmark for going to get tattoo eyeliner. So let's say you're an MGD patient, can't tolerate the makeup, I'm just going to go get tattoo eyeliner. But there is a paper showing that patients with uh, tattoo eyeliner have a higher incidence of MGD. Yeah, that's kind of been um, what I've, I've always, you know, once people have it on, I can't tell them, take go get it off. <laughs> well, it's there, it's there. But what I say to my patient is, um, please don't ever get it refreshed, hmm. is what I say. It's like, it is what it is, it's done. We'll work around it, don't worry. Um, I just need to be more mindful with my IPL to make sure I don't hit some of that pigment because it'll cause a burn. And um, <clears throat> just don't get it refreshed. Now, when it comes to tight lining, this is another common myth um, that you can't tight line your eyelid margins because you block the oil glands. We actually don't have proof that that's true. And I've observed in the clinic, in the lane, when I do my bone gland secretion scores as part of my diagnostic workup, oil comes through just fine. Under neural stimulation with the eye tear device, the oils are delivered through just fine. So this concept that the waxes block the oil delivery, the mybum delivery, I don't think that's quite true. And waxes and mybum have a very different composition anyway. It's not a complete impenetrable barrier like, like paraffin dips at the manicurist. Like that's a, that's a completely you know impermeable wax. That's not what eyeliner is. Waxes are only a teeny part of the composition of the formulation. Again, concentration and contact time. So those are, again, some of the probably bigger trends that I've ever, I've mm. seen and I see them frequently in the clinic. So uh, thank you for just bringing some light to all of those. Yeah. Uh, I do know a lot of people have asked about sunscreen mm -hmm. because we know our, uh, our skin is so delicate and uh, sun damage to the eyelid is a common cause of skin cancers. It mm -hmm. is a um, cause of aging and wrinkles and sunscreen is really important for all ages to be using, but like, again, what's what's good for sensitive eyes and sensitivities yeah. around the eye? That is a great question. And I can't point the same ocular surface safety data to anything in the sunscreen market. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with you 100%. Um, sunscreens, when they get in the eye, they sting and burn like the dickens, right? And your eyes watering the whole day. It's red and watering. So yeah, sunscreens definitely burn and irritate. And I think we need, I think there's a, a, a need in the market for dry friendly sunscreen to protect this area because you're right uh skin cancers are common here because people don't put their sunscreen up into here that's why we recommend hats and sunglasses to help bridge that part where your sunscreen isn't how we coach our patients is um i really like this brand called kinesis k-i-n-e-s-y-s spf 50 unscented it's fragrance free um alcohol free you spray it into your hands and then press it into the skin, right? Like so. Mm -hmm. Don't forget your little ears. Don't forget your neck. Don't forget your decollete. You too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then uh, whatever's left over, you can gently, carefully put here. Mm -hmm. um, but that combination is well tolerated by my male patients, my rosacea patients. It just seems to be extraordinarily well tolerated. And it layers beautifully under makeup. And of course, you know, uh, it's always important to remember to wear full UV light protecting sunglasses because uh, that right there is going to not just protect the skin, but that's also going to protect the surface of the eyeball Absolutely. from UV damage, uh, which can contribute to many conditions. And we, I've done a video on, on all these different conditions that UV light 
can can activate on the eye. Mm -hmm. um, so those are all the major questions that I had prepared. Uh, I do um, want to again just kind of give a shout out to to you, Dr. Perriman, uh, also known as the Dry Eye Master on all the socials, especially over on Instagram. Uh, you post some great content on Instagram. She has a YouTube channel herself. So everybody, please, uh, I have links in the description. Uh, go check out Dr. Perriman's uh, information over on YouTube because she's got just great in-depth content over there. And then, of course, if you want to reach out to Dr. Perriman yourself, uh, you can check out dryeyemaster.com. Or, or Dr. Perriman, why don't you let us uh, give you kind of your own uh, two cents of how people can reach out to you. Oh, I, I appreciate the the uh, support and the call outs for that. So uh, yeah, the best way to reach me is probably by Instagram messenger and uh, I would really appreciate followers. I'll try to keep bringing you really fun content, innovations, uh, great clinical cases. And every once in a while, there's some personal stuff on there, like like my dog and being cute and, you know, <laughs> my kids doing something awesome. But yeah, I try to keep it of good value for our colleagues and for our dry wonderful dry patients. The, um, so thank you again, Laura, just cause this was awesome. And I really appreciate you taking some time out of your day. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left planned for this live stream, which we're going to go into some live Q and a, uh, mm -hmm. and so huge thank you. To, uh, and Dr. Perriman uh, said yes to being on for a short few minutes here before she has to go to celebrate her birthday. So again, happy birthday to that. As always, when we do our Q and a, uh, I do just want to, again, kind of call out that Q&A is not medical advice. We mm -hmm. are not able to provide any sort of recommendations on treatment or a diagnosis of any kind. It is purely for educational purposes only. And we're not saying this just because for liability purposes to cover ourselves. We're doing it because we think you deserve the best treatment possible. And we know that the only way to have proper diagnosis treatment is to see a local eye care provider. So uh, with all that being said, for everybody, uh, if you have questions, go ahead and put a bunch of question marks, your question, and then a bunch more question marks after that. Drop that live in the chat. Okay. Uh, I do want to say a huge shout out and thank you to all of our channel members who support the Dr. Eye Health channel um, for just basically three dollars a month we have it uh people support the channel make these videos and live streams possible and uh, everybody who is a channel member uh also gets priority in the q a so uh thank you guys so much for being members of the channel so right away uh for questions i know we've had some uh good questions come up um including uh mascara while wearing contacts. Do you mm. think there's any problems with, uh, do you see any problems with mascara and wearing contacts or, or maybe you have to maybe yeah. putting contacts in first, then mascara or. Right. So it depends on the formulation of the mascara, right? Um, I would say, well, actually, I don't know if this is true. Some mascaras actually do consumer use testing amongst um, contact lens wearers as part of their group that they that they mm -hmm. test in so uh it's often done um we i think we need better labeling on how much of that is is true like some kind of regulatory label on you know safe for contact lens wearers i've seen some non-regulatory compliant claims safe for contact lens wearers but we actually don't have regulatory um, guidance yet for that particular thing and i would love to see that that's another area where we can grow. Um, would love love to see a true um, claim that's FDA vetted, mm -hmm. and and a roadmap of what it takes to get that claim from a regulatory perspective. Um, now, as far as like wearing them with your contacts, I think if you are a dry patient and you have some trouble tolerating your contacts and you're putting in drops. Uh, on a frequent basis, you will want to shy away from clean beauty, natural type products because they run so much in contact with an artificial tear. But back to that study that I did, I was shocked at how much they just kind of, and then that, that gets underneath the contact lens into the tear film, has the potential to lodge in the conjunctiva. Like I'm not a fan of those super runny, easy smear, come off with water type mm. formulations. I, I don't, I don't think that's a great way to go. Uh, but um, 
That's yeah, but good. that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, from Cheeky Nonconformist, it's just a quick question. Uh, they missed the the spray you mentioned about sunscreen. Yes. Kinesis. I wonder if I can write in the chat. K-I-N-E-S-Y-S. -S. And I'll, I'll try to find that and put links yeah. in the description Unscented below after the video. SPF 50. Um, I know this is a really good question. We did a, I did a video on it a little bit ago, but I would love to know your thoughts. This is from Fritz asked, is retinol safe under the eye? what kind of retinol yeah because there's so many how kinds, far right? down the metabolic pathway are we talking about because if it's <laughs> if it's low amounts and certain metabolic products it's probably okay if it's retin a that your dermatologist prescribes not okay right so it just totally depends on what type of retinol and what concentration how close to the eye contact time mm -hmm. it's, it all depends on that uh, this is a quick one from Leonila Romeo. Uh, can I put my foundation and mascara in the fridge? Not sure. Um, <laughs> I've never heard of this one. And, and I assume the goal is to enhance its uh, preservation and to limit the contamination potential. But um, I don't think you need to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. Products that are adequately preserved don't need to be refrigerated. That refrigeration is another method of preservation. And I think all it's going to do being cold is it's going to interfere with the flow and application of your products. So I don't think putting them in the fridge is necessary. We have a question from one of our channel members, Katori on wheels. Thank you. Uh, she asked about dying eyelashes. I, I've honestly never even heard of that. Yeah. So just like you can dye your gray hair, you can... <laughs> You can die. I've got them. I've got some. I've got them coming in. You do? Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad. Well, well, like we're in the club together now. So um, I think it depends on uh, a variety of things. So if you're blonde and you don't want to wear mascara and you want to get your eyelashes enhanced without having to wear mascara every day, maybe. It depends on how it's done, where it's done, and how careful they are around the eye. I will say that I have seen cases of eyelash dye that looked pretty good mm -hmm. and doesn't seem to cause any extra irritancy in these dry eye patients. So it depends, but you really want to go to somebody incredibly well-skilled because it's easy for that to get in the eye and it will yeah. burn. Doesn't sound good. Yeah, not good. We have this question from Natural Eye Doctors. This is kind of cool. I don't I don't, I don't know this this channel or, or um, this, this uh, commenter, Natural Eye Doctor, but it'd be great to know where, where they practice and who they are. Um, they ask, how safe is self-expression of the meibomian glands? Is it advised? Can it lead to long-term damage? I don't know. I Have you seen, I've seen one study on mice, but it was kind of unrealistic in that they put a like pressure on the meibomian glands for like an hour and it was on mice. So I'm like, I can't really, Yeah. I yeah. can't really make out, out of that data. Have you seen anything? I appreciate that question. I think we still don't really know. Like, I do think there's too much of a good thing. Like, you know, force, uh, pressure is force times area. So are you pushing with a pinpoint in one spot? Mm -hmm. That's probably too much force. But if you're using two different paddles and, you know, coming along and milking the mybum like so, that is probably okay. But we don't have good science yet yeah. to show what the maximum force should be and if it's deleterious in the long haul. And I think, you know, the vast majority of research we have shows strong support for um, thermal expression of the meibomian glands. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's all been great benefits for treatment of various forms of dry eye. So, uh, but otherwise it's still a very good question. And I've always kind of wondered if, um, how the meibomian glands could get damaged mechanically. So hopefully we'll have, I have a hot tip for you. Yeah. Um, when I do my bone gland expression, I don't always do it, um, but when I need to, uh, let's say after IPL and they've had some heat, like low-level light therapy mm -hmm. or you know something like that, IPL, low-level light therapy, I'm getting ready to do the expression. If you take your eye tear device, that little uh, neural yeah. stimulator, and then have the patient apply it alongside the nose at the same time that you're at the slit lamp and you've got your your wooden q-tip in one hand and you're holding the lid down you've got your gland clearance forceps in the other then have the patient 
buzz their nose, the side of their nose, activate the device, it enhances the expressibility mm -hmm. beautifully. Cool. Great yeah. to hear that. So I have one of those devices and we'll be doing a, a video breakdown and review of it shortly. So. Yeah, try it at the same time of your next expression. You'll be surprised at how much more you get out. Now I know we're running out of time. Uh, I do have one last question, uh, and this is going. This is a diff This is more of a broad question um, from Chestina about cataracts mm -hmm. uh, and waiting to have to remove cataracts. Uh, like, how bad does somebody's vision mm -hmm. have to be before getting cataract surgery? Uh, I know when I was trained at like in school and at the VA. Mm -hmm. um, Usually, if vision was around 20, 30, 20, 40, that was, I think most doctors would say, yeah, let's go ahead and do cataract surgery, a good candidate. Uh, however, uh, it's there's a lot of quality of life factors. Mm -hmm. And so now, even if somebody has, you know, let, let's say in a perfect room that's dim light, they got a bright projector, vision charts up there, they may be able to still kind of squeak out 20, 20. But if we do a brightness acuity test, that's where we induce glare, right? <laughs> yeah. And so with that glare, their vision can suddenly like, now they can only see 20, 60. They can't even legally drive. Right. Um, uh, what kind of, what, what do you usually, how would you answer that question, Dr. Perman? Yeah, so I agree with you that our benchmarks and metrics that we've used to, you know, help counsel a patient when the risk benefit analysis favors go ahead and getting it done has changed over time. Um, my beef is when the insurance company thinks they can make that call mm -hmm. that I don't, I have a real problem with that. They yeah. didn't see the patient. They're not a clinician. They're not an eye doctor. I think they have no business in dictating when a patient can have cataract surgery covered. Um, but, uh, I agree with you when it becomes dysfunctional, we call it dysfunctional lens syndrome. When you, it looks clear ish enough like a really low level of opacity, but to your point, when it, under certain lighting conditions, the functionality of the vision goes down and that becomes a safety hazard. So, yeah. you know, if you need to drive at night for, you know, your family or your work or whatever it is, like, I think that safety consideration uh, almost supersedes or trumps the, um, the uh, that that classic 2040 or worse uh, benchmark that we've had in the past. Uh, I do have one uh, last question. If you're okay spending an extra 60 seconds, sure. uh, it's a really good question. Uh, before we do that, I have to give a I have to put this one up from Amanda, who says, "If you're suffering from dry eye, I can see oh. Dr. Perryman. She gave me my life back." Um, thank you, Amanda, for sharing that. You definitely don't need to reveal that information, but. Um, I hope, uh, Dr. Perriman, I know you get that a lot from all of your oh, uh, patients, thank but you. it's just, seeing it on this, it, it's very, um, it's great. So thank you for sharing that, Amanda. Uh -huh. The I last question I want to pull up is, is really good, and that's from uh, Zero. Uh, does pressure of wearing a heating mask for dry mm. eye affect keratoconus in a negative way? Oh, that's such a good question. Oh, my goodness. So... Possibly. Um, I think, yeah, heat um, and pressure on a cornea that's biomechanically compromised. And we know that keratoconus patients have a predisposition to their cornea not being as um, stiff as it needs to be. And so it can become distorted and lead to conditions like keratoconus. Uh, we think that's uh, that underlying predisposition, biomechanical weakness, if you will, plus eye rubbing is a classic association. But yeah, I wonder about this. Um, it's plausible. It's feasible. I don't have hard signs to point you to. But um, I just I always tell my patients, get the heat gently on your eye. Don't mash your eyeball with it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for just all of your time, Dr. Perriman. I know uh, we're, we're holding you back from going to see your friends <laughs> and, and family for your birthday celebration. So again, happy birthday. Thank, thank you so you much for your all. time, expertise. Uh, hopefully we'll maybe even have you on again uh, to talk about another topic. So uh, I would again, love that. Anytime every, for you, buddy. Yay. <laughs> for, uh, for everybody who joined us this evening, thank you so much. Uh, we'll have additional content in the video description below, including uh, an update of everything that we were discussing. Uh, and stay tuned for next future videos on topics such as dry eye, uh, even maybe some reviews of some of the new medic um, 
mist uh, eyelid removers and things like that, deep diving into that. So uh, cool. again, stay tuned. Thank you, Dr. Perriman. Thank and you, you have everybody. a great evening. <laughs>